going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Mark and this is Entrepreneurial Finance. Lately, a lot of people have been asking me for uh, some high risk stock picks, okay? You know, they're kind of tired of those recession proof safe picks. They're kind of tired of looking at macroeconomic indicators. They want to get into the high risk, high reward stock picks. So that's exactly what this video is going to do. Like every video I make, I'm going to preach that you reassess your risk tolerance before putting any of your money on the line. A lot of these picks are extremely risky in nature. They might have potential for huge upside, but they are very risky, okay? So make sure you reassess your risk tolerance before you put any of your money into the stock market. These companies that I'm about to recommend, I've done a lot of surface research on them. I've looked into their financials. I've looked into their current events, uh, some of their management decisions. One thing I'm gonna talk about in this video for each stock that I recommend as well is the current ratio. And the current ratio is essentially your ability to pay your short-term liabilities off within the next 12 months. We're gonna look at it for every single company due to the uncertainty of what's going on worldwide right now with this global health pandemic. Let's go ahead and get into the picks. The first company I'm recommending is Orbcom, O-R-B-C. They are a relatively smaller company. They offer internet of things solutions as well as machine to machine learning that remotely monitor and track fixed mobile assets. Now, what is the Internet of Things? It is simply the basic concept of connecting to the Internet on and off with a certain device. So, for instance, the list I have here is uh, anything from cell phones, coffee makers, washing machines, headphones, lamps, any wearable devices, and pretty much everything else that you can think of. Now, a recent call with management expects their revenues to be stable throughout this time of uncertainty due to their connection to the food industry. According to management, they monitor and track about 60% of the world's food supply with their Internet of Things solutions. They have ties to many major grocers, essentially, and grocers have been deemed essential services in most countries. On top of that, insiders have been starting to slowly buy back shares into the company. So I have a nice graph up here you can see, and the buying activity is slowly starting to ramp up. So what that means when insiders are buying into the company that is that they generally expect the company to do well in the near term. There's also a very small percentage of their shares which are currently short sold, I think sitting currently at about 2.5%. They have a very strong current ratio, about 172 million in current assets and 57 million in current liabilities. Current assets can be anything from accounts receivable to cash to inventory, whereas current liabilities is generally a maturing debt within the next 12 months. One thing to be wary of is their earnings. You can see here, they basically haven't made any money yet. So just be cautious of that moving forward. Okay, the second company is Splunk, and Splunk is basically a uh, cyber security software infrastructure company. They offer software solutions that enable organizations to gain real-time operational intelligence, they call it. Its products enable users to investigate, monitor, analyze, act on data regardless of the format or source. They also have other brands such as Splunk Cloud, Splunk Behavior Analytics, and so forth. Okay, so being in the cybersecurity space, the cybersecurity market is expected to be be as large as 395 billion by 2025. Now, they also have a very strong current ratio. If you look, they have 2.82 billion in current assets and only 1.31 billion in current liabilities. So this is a company that you can depend on within the next 12 months to not go bankrupt. Now, although they've beaten EPS estimates lately, they haven't actually made much money and they have about 95% institutional ownership. So what this tells me is there is real no real path to profitability here and a lot of their insiders on their board or on their uh, management team aren't actually betting on their own company. So even though they're backed by smart money with the institutional money in their favor, their managers may not be incentivized to grow the company as if they would if they own a higher stake within the company. Also beware, this company has a market cap of about 20 billion and they've quadrupled since their IPO in 2012. So maybe there's not the value there that you might be looking for. Okay, third pick is Air Canada, and this is an airline company. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen all the headlines with the airlines being bailed out by the US government. This is a Canadian airline, and the Canadian government actually isn't bailing out the airlines as far as I know. Now, that's not the biggest deal because they do have a very strong balance sheet, and I'll get into that in a second. So in recent weeks, they've laid off 15,000 employees. 
and they could see the revenues dip almost 90% in Q2 if we use Delta Airlines as a proxy. They suspended their share buyback program March 2nd, and for those of you who have been following this airline fiasco, many companies, specifically in the US, have spent most of their free cash flow on share buybacks, which is why Air Canada has actually suspended their share buyback program as of March 2nd. Now, politicians in the US are seeking restrictions on share buybacks, and I think that's the right thing to do. They're also seeking restrictions on high-level executive compensation, and I think if that gets passed or if something happens in the States, we will see that happen happen in Canada or the Canada will follow suit with something as well. Air Canada is likely to benefit from cheaper energy prices in the near term as well. Oil and what's going on with energy worldwide is a whole nother video, but they should be able to benefit from a lower for longer term environment in energy. They also might have already seen the worst of their price decline, losing a large chunk of their share value in the near term in the last month, in the last few weeks. And one thing to be weary though of, however, is there's always market laggards and and once we see, you know, their revenues drop 90%, the people at Q2, Q3, and Q4 are certainly going to sell off. So just be wary of that moving forward. There's also the question of how people are or how consumer behavior will be affected by this pandemic after it's over and after these government government wide lockdowns are removed. Are people going to be rushing to jump on the plane to go travel? Maybe not. Now, one positive though, is that there's extremely high barriers to entry in the airline industry. Air Canada is a very well known brand worldwide, especially in Canada. Obviously, that's where they are headquartered. <laughs> Most analysts have this stock rated as a buy. Good to know, but always don't forget to formulate your own opinions before investing in any stock. Now, even though they're trading uh, at a potential bargain currently, there's going to be some volatility moving forward, okay? They're going to be burning through cash for a prolonged period of time here, but they do have a strong current ratio as mentioned above. They have about, I think, 7 billion in current assets and close to 7 billion in current liabilities. So that is favorable for them, but we don't know how long this vaccine is going to take to develop. It could be anywhere from six to 18 months. In that time, they will essentially be burning through cash, even though they've laid off a good chunk of their labor force. Okay, fourth recommendation is Snapchat and Snapchat is still sitting well below their IPO price. I think a lot of Wall Street investors are kind of unsure about this company. A lot of their services are easily replicable and you saw that Instagram basically copied their facial recognition and how you can like face swap and all that stuff. So anyways, uh, they have a good mix of ownership. About 27.53% is insider ownership. So you can see executives within the company are betting on this company to do well in the short term, which is always good to see. Pretty low institutional ownership below 50% at 48% and they have a high percentage of retail ownership. So you see what this means to me is that they have very strong brand recognition. Everyday investors like you and me have shares in this company and you can see that by their 24% stake in the company. Now the percentage of shares which are short sold is kind of high. It's sitting at about 7.5%. Usually you like to see that below 5% or even lower. One good thing is that we're basically seeing little to no impact in terms of usage on the platform during this pandemic. You're not gonna see this company take as much of a hit in revenues as you will per se an airline. However, they've basically made no money since their inception. You can see the revenues are trending upwards, but their earnings are definitely not. So there is no clear path to profitability and that is one thing that is scary about Snapchat. They do have a strong current ratio. So within the next 12 months, there should be no issue in terms of being able to pay their obligations. They have about 2.64 billion in current assets and 499 million in current liabilities. Now they have very strong brand recognition domestically, although they have many competitors like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, etc. but there is plenty of room to grow internationally, which should allow them to grow a decent amount in the future. Okay, last thing about Snapchat is that their CEO, Evan Spiegel is very young, he's inexperienced and he does have a knack to overspend. Just be wary, again, this is a high risk pick. There is potential for this team to explode if they come up with some innovative features in the future. Even if they're potentially trading for a bargain, they are high risk at this point. So last pick is going to be Uber slash Lyft. I already made a video about Uber. Check it out in the card I'm gonna put up at the top of this video right now, but I essentially consider them the same thing. They do the same thing. They're both ride hailing, ride sharing companies, even though Uber might have stronger brand recognition at this point. Even though their rides are down currently, uh, their food delivery service is actually soaring. They're also sitting well below their IPO price. I mean, that's not really 
really indicative of anything except that maybe it was an exit strategy for senior management once they went public, but there's no real clear path to profitability at this point. I think their best option or their best chance at being extremely profitable in the future is autonomous vehicles. So they're essentially a killer of the taxi industry. They're extremely popular with the younger dem demographics. So as these millennials, as these Gen Z people grow up, you expect them to continue using their services as they become the dominant portion of the labor force. Their current ratio also extremely strong. So you don't have to worry about the risk of bankruptcy in the next 12 months. Now in 2019, you can see there was a massive earnings dip and this was mainly due to uh, driver rewards as well as stock based compensation. Most analysts are recommending this stock a buy. One thing to be cautious about though is management and management ratios. They've shown that they're not extremely effective. Return on assets sitting at negative 19% in the trailing 12 month period and return on equities minus 77.5%. So again, an extremely risky pick, which is the whole point of this video. These are five high risk picks which have potential for huge upside. Not all of them will achieve that goal. Those are my five high risk picks for the turbulent investing period of 2020. As I mentioned, there's tons of economic uncertainty right now with governments holding the lion's share of the power as to when we all go back to work or that we can all start working at our office or at our regular jobs again. The good news is central banks are printing money and the government are offering plenty of rewards to people going into unemployment to help stimulate our economy during these tough times. These are exactly what central banks were created for and they are definitely doing their job. The only thing to note though is that they're pretty much ruining the natural cycle of the market. Never forget to formulate your own opinions before putting any of your money on the line and I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Okay, so that's what I have for you today. If you did enjoy, don't forget to like, subscribe, share the video with a friend if you learned something and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace out.